All right, everybody, welcome to uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Curtis Donsky. Uh, Dr. Donsky is an infectious diseases physician and chair of the Infection Control Committee at the Cleveland VA Medical Center. He is a professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve <coughs> University. His research focuses primarily on epidemiology and control of healthcare associated pathogens, particularly Clostridium difficile. Specific areas of interest include understanding the impact of antibiotics on pathogen colonization, identifying routes of transmission, and evaluation of strategies to reduce skin and environmental contamination. His research has been funded by the Department of Veteran Affairs, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, today, Dr. Donsky is going to be speaking to us about infection control for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we're very happy to have him here. Uh, before we start, just uh, uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to post them into the chat. Uh, Dr. Donsky, you can feel free to uh, pull up the chat as, as you go, or we can answer questions at the end, either way. Uh, without further ado, I'll pass it off to Dr. Donsky. Terrific. Uh, thank you. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, none of which will be pertinent to uh, what I'll talk about today. Uh, so our objective is to understand current concepts regarding transmission and control of SARS-CoV-2. And I would just point out at the beginning that there are no uh, randomized trials for infection control interventions that I'll be presenting today. Most of what we appreciate about transmission of SARS-CoV-2 comes from lab simulations and outbreak investigations, and I'll present several of those today. So the first question I'll address is why is it so difficult uh, to prevent transmission? And I think the best way to, to consider that is to look at the natural history of COVID-19 infection. So the, the incubation period for SARS-CoV-2 is about six days on average. And the red line there represents the viral load or the amount of viral shedding. And so as you can see, day zero there is the time of onset of symptoms. Patients are most highly infectious around the time they're diagnosed and for a few days thereafter. And then it decreases dramatically after that. Uh, a PCR can remain positive for a long time after resolution of symptoms, uh, but that does not represent shedding of viable virus. So the infectious period is shown by the green bar at the top of the screen. So basically from day about minus two to day 10, patients are shedding viable virus that you can culture and are infectious. And the most highly infectious period is from about day minus one to day five. So there are really two important points to take away in terms of transmission. One is that patients can be mildly symptomatic or even have no symptoms and have the exact same uh, curve here. There's patients who are, you know, someone may think they have an allergy uh, or um, some a mild stuffy nose and not even really think they have COVID, but can be highly infectious. And then the second major point is that patients who are pre-symptomatic are already shedding. So if you develop, if you develop symptoms on day one, it's like that you were shedding a day or two days earlier than that uh, and, and potentially highly infectious. And these patients, this pre-symptomatic period is really felt to be a particularly important time when transmission occurs. Uh, and again, here's an illustration from the VA of the potential for transmission during this pre-symptomatic period. So we have presumed transmission of SARS-CoV-2 by a pre-symptomatic van driver. So at the VA, we have vans that drive uh, veterans in from outlying clinics to the Cleveland VA. Uh, one of our van drivers was diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. Uh, he had an exposure out in the community uh, that he d d neglected to tell us about. Uh, he uh, d was diagnosed with COVID-19, and so then we did contact tracing. And so part of the contact tracing was looking back for the prior two days. And so this was a trip that our van driver took one day before onset of symptoms. So he feels fine. He's driving two veterans in. They're well, and our measures are everybody's wearing a mask in the van, and they're maintaining, obviously, maintaining good spacing. The pink is, represents our veterans who are sitting in the van with our van driver in red, and there should be screening for symptoms and, and prior exposures. So both of these veterans, uh, shown in pink, uh, became infected with, uh, with uh, COVID-19. Uh, one, one of these veterans is sitting six feet away from our van driver, and the other is 10 feet away. 
and I'll come back to why that, uh, how we think transmission may have occurred uh, later. But we have a pre-symptomatic individual who's transmitting uh, uh, COVID-19. And if we, again, if we go back to the natural history here, our uh, van driver was most highly infectious before he was diagnosed, and then one day out, then a couple of days after diagnosis. So at that time, the person who was screening him, collecting the nasal swab for the diagnosis was at high risk and wore appropriate PPE. The patient later developed a cough and shortness of breath and was admitted to the VA hospital for several days. At that point, the patient was post-infection and, and, and was likely not uh, providing any risk to the providers at all. It was before he ever came into the hospital uh, that he was uh, presenting the greatest risk. And this is where we're seeing most of the transmission out in the community. So asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection is really a major driver of transmission. About 20% of SARS-CoV-2 cases remain entirely asymptomatic throughout their course. Uh, those individuals may have a similar viral load or a lower viral load uh, based on several different studies. And overall, they have, a, they have a transmission risk, but it's decreased overall compared to individuals who develop symptoms about a relative risk of about 0.35. Uh, it's important to point out that even though the overall percentage of individuals who remain asymptomatic is 20%, it may be different in different populations. So, for example, in nursing homes, in a survey of 182 nursing homes, 41% of those detected were asymptomatic. And this is what we expect uh, taking care of nursing home populations where they may not mount a fever or develop other symptoms uh, that you might see uh, with, a, with a younger population. Uh, so in a CDC modeling study that just was uh, published this week, uh, they estimated that more than half of transmission occurs from individuals who are asymptomatic, with 35% of transmission from pre-symptomatic individuals and 24% of transmission from people who ne never develop symptoms. So it's no wonder that we have a great deal of difficulty in controlling SARS because transmission is occurring uh, from individuals who look uh, as healthy as you and I. Uh, the CDC currently recommends that if you have a, a, a non, are non-immunocompromised and have a SARS infection, that you can come out of isolation after 10 days, you're considered at low risk to transmit at that point. If you're immunocompromised, you can come out of isolation after 20 days as a general guideline. However, there are a couple of recent studies that have demonstrated persistent shedding of viable SARS-CoV-2 in cancer patients well beyond 20 days. So in a study that just from the New England Journal this past week, uh, they looked at uh, three cancer patients. They had persistent shed a recovery of viable virus by culture from 25 to 61 days uh, out from their uh, initial onset of symptoms. Another study, a lymphoma patient uh, who was on B-cell-directed antibody therapies that was culture positive for 119 days. So at the VA, when we see these patients, infectious diseases as a consult, for patients who are immunocompromised, and we try to consider whether these patients are really ready to come out of isolation after 20 days, or if they need a longer period of isolation, potentially. So next question is related to, you know, question number one, why is testing as a sole control measure uh, ineffective? And you can easily see why that is, if you just, again, look at the curve. If someone, if you are scheduling a family gathering and you're pre-testing everybody, uh, before, they, before they gather together. All you have to do is miss one person where you do the screening while they're in the incubation period, and the next day when they show up for your gathering, they may be highly infectious. And that's nicely illustrated. This is a case uh, uh, report that nicely illustrates that. This is an outbreak of COVID-19 at an overnight summer school retreat. So they tried this approach. They, they uh, required a negative PCR within seven days or a positive serology within three months for all of these kids coming to the camp. They were supposed to self-quarantine, these are teenagers of course, self-quarantine for seven days before travel. But then once they got there, because we had a negative test, everyone just did the usual things. Everyone was sleeping in bunk beds and doing all of the usual camp activities with no masks or social distancing. So as you can see on the figure there on day three, one of our individuals who had just tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 developed symptoms. Uh, and then 78 total attendees of this camp, about half of them uh, were diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 and 38 had, had symptoms that were highly suggestive and had probable SARS-CoV-2. So uh, this uh, approach to prevention does not work at summer camp or at family gatherings or in the White House or wherever you want to implement this. It's not enough to just pre-screen people. 
Next question, you know, what is the risk of transmission from family members? So if I am diagnosed with COVID-19, what is the risk to my family members? Or if someone in my family gets it, how, how at risk am I? And so the overall household transmission rate from a number of studies uh, in the systematic review is about 19%. So your risk is about 20% uh, if someone in your household has, has COVID-19. And as you might anticipate, if your spouse has COVID-19, it's even higher, about 43%. And interestingly, for children, children seem to be, uh, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, less likely to transmit in households or less, and even less likely to acquire COVID-19 than adults. Uh, and exposure in households, of course, is, is your much greater uh, prolonged contact. And so uh, in studies that have done a comparison, your risk in it for a healthcare exposure is much less than for a household exposure. Next question, are healthcare personnel caring for COVID-19 patients? So when we care for patients, are we at high risk to acquire, acquire an infection? And the answer I think is if we're not wearing appropriate protective equipment or following uh, appropriate measures, the risk is very high. Uh, so this was an outbreak in a nursing home early, very early in the pandemic uh, in King County, Washington, where they first had cases in the US. And in this scenario, green is visitors, uh, orange is healthcare personnel, blue is residents uh, in this large outbreak in the facility. Uh, so in the absence of appropriate uh, protective measures, 50 healthcare personnel working in this one nursing home became infected. Half of them were hospitalized. And this is what we can expect if you go in and take care of a COVID-19 patient without uh, appropriate measures. So since then, however, most of the data has been actually quite reassuring. And this, you know, this really was a big question because a lot of healthcare workers acquired uh, SARS-1 and Ebola uh, with previous uh, outbreaks. For COVID-19, the situation appears to be more reassuring. So in a study from the University of Washington, they looked at symptomatic personnel being tested and frontline workers who are working with COVID patients were about as likely, were similar, had a similar risk of COVID-19 as non-frontline staff. So working among COVID-19 patients did not increase your risk. A number of seroprevalence studies have shown the same thing. Uh, so from the Ann Arbor VA, similar seroprevalence among personnel providing patient care versus no patient care activities. Uh, the, the scenario where you see <clears throat> an increased risk among personnel caring for patients typically are publications from early in the pandemic. So for example, in an England teaching hospital, there was an increased risk if you worked on a COVID ward, uh, but it was actually lower in the ICU uh, where, there were <clears throat> where personnel were using respirators and PPE training was provided. <clears throat> uh, in 13 US hospitals, not wearing a face mask and PPE shortages were associated with positive serology. And again, so all of the, if you see a study that says uh, you are at higher risk taking care of COVID-19 patients, check on when, what the timing of that study was, because that's, that's the trend that I've seen is that, or that we currently are doing a pretty good job of protecting personnel. Uh, one of the things we're obviously doing uh, to maintain protection is universal masking of personnel. And there are a couple of nice studies that suggest and really demonstrate that once universal masking was implemented, we've reduced our rates of COVID-19 among personnel. And the red line there shows healthcare acquired COVID-19 incidents in healthcare personnel uh, with, the, with the vertical line showing when universal masking was implemented. And so a dramatic reduction in risk once we started doing universal masking uh, in comparison to community rates of acquisition. So the CDC currently recommends that you not only wear a mask if you're gonna be uh, having prolonged significant exposure to patients or to your coworkers, they recommend wearing eye protection as well because with respiratory droplets, those viruses can enter through the, uh, through the eyes. Uh, and use of, so use of protect, eye protection is recommended during all patient care encounters in areas with moderate to substantial community transmission. And again, this also holds if you are having, if you are on rounds with a medical team for two hours, all in close proximity, or if you're sitting in a medicine workroom in close proximity, it's also recommended that you wear uh, uh, goggles or a face shield as well. As well. So healthcare personnel 
are at risk to be exposed uh, to SARS-CoV-2 at work, and where do those exposures occur? Uh, these are high-risk exposures among personnel with COVID-19 at the, at the VA, uh, looking from March through July for a, from a publication uh, from earlier in the year. And the, the, we're looking at the number of exposures there for, for healthcare personnel who subsequently developed COVID-19. And the purple bar there shows patients. So early in the pandemic, there were a number of exposures of, of personnel working at the VA to patients and this almost always occurred when we had an unsuspected case admitted to the hospital. So a patient would come in with diabetic ketoacidosis, um, and somebody on hospital day two or three would suddenly say, boy, that patient is coughing a lot, and send a COVID test that would be positive, and there were lots of potential exposures during that time period. Uh, you know, patients would come in with, with we've become much better at recognizing that COVID uh, presentations can be a little bit a, a, um you know, atypical, you don't have to have all of the features of a respiratory infection, so we're doing much more aggressive testing now. And so you can see the purple bars have come down dramatically. We're really not seeing many significant high-risk exposures to patients. What we are now seeing, and which I'm sure you're seeing here at UH as well, is exposures to personnel. So someone who will be diagnosed with COVID, and when we do contact tracing, we find that you've had exposures to other healthcare workers. And um, that's shown in the blue bar there. Uh, for our facility, and these are the common scenarios that we've seen at the VA. Uh, so someone is pre-symptomatic or they're working despite having some mild symptoms. They come in, they don't think they really could have COVID because they just have a little sniffle. Um, there's non-compliance with masks in non-clinical work areas, so you're in the workroom. Uh, you don't want to wear your mask all day. People take let their guard down in that situation. Uh, shared meals, we had an outbreak in our operating room area where uh, a couple of nursing aides were, uh, were you know, very uh, sociable and we had uh, lunch with, as a group with a bunch of other people and shared their meals and shared COVID as well. Uh, so in that scenario, um, you want to, uh, we pretty much try to restrict that as much as possible. We expect everybody to not share meals at this point. And often people had no high-risk exposures. They had multiple low-risk exposures uh, uh, while in healthcare settings. So instead of spending, spending 15 minutes at one time exposed to another person, by the time over the course of an eight hour shift, you might be have a two minute exposure here and there that all adds up to more than 15 minutes. And so we've had a number of clusters of infections at the VA where someone from the community will, will appear to have acquired COVID-19 in the community and then come to work. And then we've had, out, had uh, little clusters in outpatient clinics, in the emergency department, in our police service, all kinds of areas around the facility um, that we're currently looking at. Um, there was an interesting story in the, in the news where this was suggested a large cluster. Uh, there was an inflatable Christmas costume that is speculated uh, that may have spread coronavirus at a California hospital. So somebody in the emergency department wanted to spread Christmas cheer and they put on this inflatable costume that has a fan to keep the costume inflated. Uh, the person was unknowingly uh, asymptomatically carrying uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. There were 44 cases of COVID-19 in personnel uh, with one death. And so uh, there are a number of uh, scenarios like this where personnel are coming to work and unknowingly transmitting COVID-19. I would just mention that in this scenario, as in our van outbreak, uh, they're really, it's really essential that to really state that this is how transmission occurred, that we do sequencing of the virus because it's certainly possible that transmission, that, that if you do sequencing, you'll see that th these are not all linked cases. There may be multiple scenarios because there's lots of transmission in the community. Is it really from this, uh, this individual? Uh, you need sequencing to definitively say that. So the next couple of questions will refer to routes of transmission of respiratory viruses. And the general belief on the part of the CDC and, and most experts is that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is very much like influenza. It's primarily transmitted through large respiratory droplets that will fall to the ground within three to six feet uh, if I cough or sneeze. Um, with uh, direct contact as well, so your hands can be a, a source for, for transfer of viruses as well uh, if you are infected. Uh, and uh, again, also through close contact. 
with a lesser degree of trans transmission, but can also occur through indirect contact with surfaces. So if I touch a surface and I'm infected and then you touch the same surface, you could pick up virus. And then airborne transmission, uh, is there's a lot of debate about how important airborne transmission might be, uh, which really implies small droplet nuclei that spread well beyond six feet in rooms. And so, there, again, there's a lot of debate about whether we should be doing more to address airborne transmission. Uh, in, in the JAMA recently, there was an, there was an article um, one month that from someone who's basically reviewed the literature and said there's really no risk for airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. We should just focus on droplets. And about two months later, there was another article from someone who s said that we should all be buying specialized equipment to decontaminate the air in our in our hospitals. So there's a very uh, wide degree of difference of opinion here. So this is a, an illustration of airborne transmission of measles, uh, where they're, it's very nicely documented for measles and TB, a lot of similar scenarios like this. So a child came into the pediatrician's office, uh, is number one there, has measles, and after the child, that child leaves the office, a number of other, other children come into the office and all acquire measles infection. They're not in the building at the same time as the child who was infected strongly implicating airborne shed, that the virus is lingering in the air and you can acquire it after a, ch a child leaves the building. There are no similar case reports as of now for SARS-CoV-2 in healthcare settings uh, that looks completely similar to that. Uh, there are a number of reports like this that, that really suggest that airborne transmission may be relatively uncommon. So this is routes of SARS-CoV-2 transmission during two nosocomial outbreaks. So we looked at two index patients with unsuspected COVID-19. We did several aerosol-generating procedures on these people with no precautions, including intubating a patient um, without negative pressure and without wearing, wearing uh, you know, masks. Uh, only eight of the 421 exposed personnel developed COVID-19. All of them had close contact without sufficient PPE, and their interpretation of this is that there's really minimal evidence for airborne transmission in this setting, that the virus is not floating around in the air and heading out into the hallway and going to make you uh, uh, sick uh, without close contact with the patient. Uh, what has been demonstrated, and the CDC modified their commentary two or three months ago, uh, is that if you have poor ventilation, if you're in an area where there's not adequate ventilation, you can see transmission. So hospitals have regulations and requirements for air exchanges. So in every hospital room, you have to have at least six total air exchanges in the room every hour. In an operating room, it would be you know, 12 or in an isolation room. So there's excellent air exchange in most, healthcare, in most areas in healthcare facilities. Um, and that is not necessarily the case out in the community where in your house, it may be less than one air exchange per hour. So here's a scenario where there was a nursing home outbreak due to inadequate ventilation. So this is a nursing home that has six separate wards. Uh, there was an outbreak on one of those, they were all interconnected. There was an outbreak on one of those six uh, nursing home wards. And what had happened is they had installed an energy efficient ventilation system on the outbreak ward that re was recirculating unfiltered air in that and on that ward. And with that scenario, this was the outbreak that they saw, nursing home residents and personnel uh, acquired uh, COVID-19. And so you, I'm sure you have heard there have been some outbreak, there have been some concern about restaurants or there's in, in case control studies, one of the risk factors for acquiring COVID-19 is going to eat at a restaurant, uh, especially if you're sitting indoors. And the, in both uh, cases that have been reported, this is the scenario. Uh, so in this restaurant in Korea, uh, index case B uh, is, is circled there. Uh, had COVID-19 and sat down in the restaurant there. And, in, and patient and uh, customer A was infected after five minutes of exposure at a distance of 21 feet. In index case C was infected after 21 minutes of exposure at 16 feet. So social distancing of six feet is not gonna protect you from getting COVID-19 in this scenario. And the reason for that is believed to be because, again, we have poor ventilation in that setting. In this case, they're running an air conditioner that was, had a direct uh, circuit of air running from index case B 
directly toward uh, in customer A and C. So you can easily transmit, uh, transport respiratory droplets uh, from one side of the restaurant to another. Uh, and interestingly, A and C were, happened to be patrons who were pointing directly at uh, the index case. The people who were faced away from the index case uh, did not acquire COVID-19. One other example, uh, this is SARS-CoV-2 transmission on a bus from so early in the, in the pandemic in China. Uh, nobody was wearing masks on this bus. They had a pre-symptomatic index case again. There was a 34% attack rate on the bus. So you see the index case there. All of those colored uh, seats there, uh, colored uh, rectangles there represent seats where individuals acquired COVID-19. Uh, there was a 0% transmission on a second bus going to the same event where they didn't have an index case. Um, and there was similar risk, obviously, if you look at the, at the figure there, if you're sitting close or far away from the index case. And in this scenario, they had an air conditioner that was on recirculation mode, which they were just recirculating uh, potentially contaminated air throughout the bus. So if you look at the CDC, I think most of us who do healthcare don't spend a lot of time reading the CDC section on, on buildings and ventilation, but they have entire sections devoted to uh, what you should do if you, uh, if you own a hospital or a restaurant to, to uh, make your building safe. Uh, and here's a, a section on transportation. Uh, they make a variety of recommendations when using transportation, including, you know, you know open the windows. Uh, here's one of their comments. Uh, ask the driver to improve ventilation if possible. For example, opening the windows or setting the air ventilation, air conditioning mode on non-recirculation because uh, uh, you can set your, your AC to recirculate air. Uh, this, however, is not uh, going to per per perfectly protect you. So this, again, is our van outbreak at the VA. So if we put, up, put the air conditioning on recirculation, uh, we do see that air moves throughout the van. But in this case, actually, without recirculation on, if you turn on the heater, so this, this uh, uh, incident occurred in December. So all you have to do is turn on the heater, and we had a smoke generator, uh, that we put next to the heater, and we can see that air is blown all the way to the back of the van uh, and therefore exposing our, our individuals in the van to uh, air breathed by our index patient. It is gen so those are high-risk settings, transportation, restaurants. It is generally believed that air travel, even though people worry more about air travel, is actually a relatively low uh, risk setting. And that is because an airplane is very much like an operating room. Uh, you have an air, you can see on the right, on the figure, there are air inlets from the top and the side of the plane. Air comes down and then is recirculated through an air outlet at the bottom by your feet. And then as it comes back through, it is, is filtered through a HEPA filter. So you have air that's moving not vertically, uh, not, you know, horizontally up and down the plane, but it moves in a narrow kind of vertical area. And they've done simulations of this in airplanes where 99.99% .99 of particles released into the air were removed from the cabin within six minutes, which is outstanding kind of air change. They HEPA filter and you have rapid air recirculation. So confirmed in flight transmission, you will see reports in, in you know, publications and reports in the, uh, in the press that about transmission in airplanes, confirmed in flight transmission is actually very rare. There are probably six or seven reports of transmission of COVID-19 on airplanes. And if you look at those reports in each of them, the individuals who uh, acquired infection were sitting uh, in seats that were relatively close to the index case. We're not seeing, unlike in the bus, we're not seeing transmission from the front of the airplane all the way to the back of the plane. So the CDC recommend. so the, the real question for us is, would there, and, and I don't know the answer to this yet, I think a lot of people are moving forward with interventions like this though. Uh, can we make places like gyms and restaurants safer uh, and more like hospitals or airplanes by improving ventilation? So the CDC in their guidance actually have these statements uh, in addition to other strategies to improve ventilation, consider upper room or induct UV irradiation as a supplement to inactivate SARS. 
And in this case, you have UV zone at the top of the room. You have a UV light that is shielded at the top of the room uh, that is very effective at killing SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses and bacteria. Uh, when you breathe, your warm air, it rises and is, is killed. You also can use a fan to, to uh, move the air around in the room and ensure good movement of air. Uh, the other thing you can consider is portable HEPA filtration systems in higher risk areas like your home, and when in discussing this with the engineers at the VA, they do not feel this would be of any real benefit in the hospital setting, but it could be a benefit in homes or uh, in restaurant settings. So this is an area that really requires a lot of additional uh, exploration. So uh, next question, Our, so that's airborne transmission. Our hands an important vector for transmission, so I can't give an infection control talk without putting in a plug for hand hygiene since that's our, that's what we always do in infection control. So here's a quote from the leader of China, let's not shake hands in this special time. Uh, this was on a trip to visit Wuhan, and that's a very wise uh, comment. Uh, there is very, and this is based on data from other viruses, but there's very nice evidence that if you want to transmit a cold from one person to another, one of the most effective ways to do that is simply to go and shake hands with another person. This has been demonstrated in very nice uh, studies with college students at the University of Virginia, where you know, 50, 80 percent of people who just simply shake hands with someone who has a cold can acquire that virus and, be and become sick. Uh, it's also been shown that SARS-CoV-2 can survive for up to nine hours on human skin, so hand hygiene is very important. Uh, this was a very disappointing headline that was in the Plain Dealer just a few days ago. Uh, coronavirus has made the fist bump our new greeting, and so this is uh, uh, President-elect Joe Biden fist bumping uh, someone after receiving his first dose of the coronavirus vaccine, so this is really not a good idea. Uh, and it, this is an illustration we did in the lab that, that just to demonstrate that, so bacteriophage MS2 is a very benign virus that you can, you can put anywhere you want, it's completely benign. Uh, so in this case, we uh, applied it to a key computer keyboard and mouse, and then we had, had an individual go and use that computer keyboard and mouse, and then you know, sit around for a few minutes where they you know, went, did their usual thing with their hands, uh, from the back of their hands to the front of their hands, and then they did a handshake with one person and a fist bump with the other. And as you can see, the handshake did a little better than the fist bump, but fist bump is a very efficient means to transfer uh, live virus from one person to another. So if you're going to uh, do a greeting of some sort, I would uh, discourage any sort of hand contact greeting. And I think, you know, I think we're in the era now of the elbow bump as opposed to fist bumps or hand, handshake. Uh, next point, uh, you know, again, cleaning is one of the things that is recommended by the CDC. You know, are we overdoing it in terms of what we're doing with cleaning? Uh, so. In, even here in Cleveland, there have been stories in the paper about uh, using ultraviolet light for buses and subway cars, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. This is an ultraviolet light in, in subway in New York City. Uh, electrostatic sprayers for first responder vehicles, closing down the subway and deep cleaning for two hours a night. And so all of these are somewhat sensible early in the pandemic because there is evidence that you can transmit viruses from one person to another by fomites and other surfaces. Uh, especially uh, cold viruses. Uh, but the natural response to, to all of this uh, uh, aggressive cleaning was that somebody said uh, this, there's an exaggerated risk of transmission by fomites, and the argument being that a lot of these lab studies uh, provide artificial test conditions, so it's been shown that SARS can survive on surfaces for hours to days if you had artificially inoculated in the lab. Uh, but you know, calling into question that, does that really represent what happens in the real world setting? Uh, at that point, live virus had not been recovered from hospital surfaces. So there have been, there have been a number of stories in the, uh, in the lay press with titles like Hy hygiene theater is a huge waste of time. So a lot of this aggressive, overly aggressive cleaning that we do uh, is maybe a bit over the top. Uh, these are, so there now has been a, uh, at least one publication where we've shown that you can culture SARS-CoV-2 from environmental surfaces. So this is positive cultures in the room of a patient with severe COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, and this person was on non-invasive ventilation, high flow oxygen. Um, and in this scenario, they cultured live uh, SARS-CoV-2 from equipment, from the floor, from patient bedding, from bed rails, 
et cetera. And this, again, supports the, the advice of the CDC and the WHO that it's reasonable to do frequent cleaning of surfaces in rooms of uh, SARS-CoV-2 patients. And if you have a, someone in your household has SARS-CoV-2, you probably should wipe down the, the television remote before you go in, uh, and watch TV after they, after they did that. Um, one other point that's made by the CDC about what we should do to address uh, transmission uh, is illustrated here. There's a simulated restaurant with a contaminated index customer. So one of the things that they recommend is that um, for if you're going to a restaurant, you should not share the same menu. You should use an electronic menu or a disposable menu, um, or, and you should you know, not use the same pen for every customer, uh, or you should clean it between customers. So we did, a, a, again, a simple simulation where we had index uh, customer number one came in with hand contamination, and then we, had, we shared menus and pens uh, with subsequent customers. And we can, again, nicely demonstrate in this uh, simulated restaurant that the index customer deposits all kinds of live virus at their seat when they're sitting there from their hands, and it, and it can be transferred to the second and third customer simply by using the same menu and the same pen. Uh, and you can eliminate this transfer by wiping down the seat after customers leave and by um, av avoiding shared menus and so on. And so this is consistent with uh, what the CDC recommends. Uh, final couple of points, you know, will source control with nasal and oral antiseptics protect against SARS-CoV-2? There are a number of reports uh, in the literature and in the press uh, no noting that mouthwash can be effective in killing SARS-CoV-2 uh, and it might slow the spread of the disease. Uh, gargling is actually a common practice in parts of Asia to prevent viral respiratory infections. There's mixed data in the literature about whether this actually works or not, gargling with salt water, for example, or with iodine. Uh, nasal alcohol and povidone iodine have been, are commonly used for MRSA. Um, and so we are currently, uh, so I, I'll show you first, this is the data for uh, nasal alcohol. So there is, nasal alcohol is very effective at killing SARS-CoV-2, but when we actually looked at, this is looking at reduction of uh, MRSA in, in colonized patients. So nasal alcohol actually had almost minim, minimal to no effect, and, it let, and if it did have an effect, it only lasted for a very short period of time in MRSA patients. And you can imagine why that is. So if you apply alcohol hand sanitizer to your hands, it's a nice smooth surface, you get about 20 seconds of antimicrobial activity killing the MRSA in your hands. If on the other hand, you have a big hairy nose there full of mucus, uh, and MRSA is growing in the mucus layer, in the hair follicles, um, and on the surface of the hair. MR alcohol has only a very transient effect, briefly suppresses MRSA, and it basically comes right back as soon as you stop the application. And so probably the only reason you haven't heard about nasal alcohol uh, during the COVID pandemic, people promoting this is that the companies that sell nasal alcohol were sued during the H1N1 pandemic. Uh, for false advertising of uh, saying that they prevented H1N1. Now, povidone iodine is more interesting. So what you need if you want to have a protective effect is a product that gives you persistent antimicrobial activity. So in this case, povidone iodine does that. Uh, this is data for MRSA patients just showing that you get activity for up to 12 hours. So we're currently doing a study at the VA where COVID-19 patients receive every eight hours get treated with povidone iodine to see if we can suppress uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in respiratory secretions, and there are other studies going on to trying to, to prevent uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the same with the same product or similar long-acting products. Uh, brief comment: Will new technologies help uh, to control COVID-19? So there are a number of uh, very inventive uh, uh, healthcare workers out there who are putting together various. Uh, designs of portable barriers that might help us. This is from the Mayo Clinic where they had a negative pressure face shield for flexible laryngoscopy. Um, they have in instrumentation ports, a side port for suction, and this has been successfully used for transnasal laryngoscopy. And so it remains to be seen. This obviously can work. Uh, the question is, is this something that's easy enough to use that people will continue using it after the pandemic? Uh, a couple of final uh, odds and ends uh, at, uh, to finish. Uh, animals as a source of transmission uh, are not currently believed to be an important source of transmission. However, uh, non-human, you should be aware that non-human primates can be affected. So dogs, cats, ferrets, hamsters can all pick up and carry uh, SARS-CoV-2. 
Interestingly, unlike influenza, not pigs or poultry when they've tried to uh, inoculate them. And then I was not aware that mink farming was such a big deal, but apparently they were, it's a large industry. Uh, outbreaks on 16 mink farms have been reported in the Netherlands. It was the virus was initially introduced by humans, and then there was transmission between mink farms. 68% uh, of workers in contacts had evidence of infection, and there was clear evidence of animal to human uh, transmission. So this is something just to keep an eye on uh, as, as things go on if we see any evidence that animals may be a, a reservoir for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, just one uh, aside uh, note, uh, you may have also seen in the news, there was this report of zombie mink uh, rising from Denmark's mass graves after a COVID-19 slaughter. So they slaughtered millions of mink uh, to try to prevent the virus from being transmitted further. And they had some uh, viral variants that they were particularly interested in preventing the uh, uh, preventing transfer to humans. And so they slaughtered all these mink. They didn't bury them in deep enough graves. And so the various gases were produced during decomposition. And so millions of mink were exploding out of the ground uh, from, their, from their cold graves. Just an aside. Um, fecal transmission. So early in the, uh, in the pandemic, there was a lot of concern about this because it's been known that SARS-CoV-2 receptors are present in the GI tract. Uh, viral RNA is frequently detected in feces. But in the early studies, no one recovered actual live virus from feces. We said this is just, you know, again, shedding of non-viable virus. However, uh, there now has been at least one report, or a couple of reports actually, with, where they have evidence of viable SARS-CoV-2 recovered from feces. Uh, in one study, SARS-CoV-2 was cultured from stool specimens in two of three COVID-19 patients tested. And they comment in that article that, you know, previous studies really were not doing enough to uh, eliminate inhibitors uh, for, of culture from their, uh, in their test scenarios, and so they, they think this is an under-representation. Uh, and then transfer of SARS-CoV-2 infection to ferrets has been demonstrated by intranasal inoculation of stool or urine from COVID-19 patients, so don't, uh, don't sniff uh, stool or urine. Um, so this, again, is an area, so I think the CDC does not you know, recognize this as a potential issue at all at this point. There is, however, one interesting article. So you, rem you may remember from the SARS-1 outbreaks years ago that there was an outbreak in an apartment building um, where d there was a great deal of transmission that was believed to be through fecal transmission and kind of faulty plumbing. So someone published in the Annals of Internal Medicine a very similar report for SARS-CoV-2. So they had three families vertic in vertically aligned apartments apartments connected by drainage pipes in the bathrooms, and they demonstrated that fecal aerosol transmission was potentially possible based on environmental sampling, so they could show that the virus was on surfaces in, in, uh, in, in various uh, of, of these apartments, and by tracer gas studies. So in this plumbing scenario, there's a, there's a vent pipe where gases can rise and can easily get into the next apartment, if you have a scenario where someone hasn't used their bathtub in a period of time, the normal P-trap there that prevents uh, gases from getting into your apartment can actually fail, and you can have uh, kind of speculated fecal respiratory transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, final point, uh, there was a nice uh, discussion in the New York Times uh, a few months ago uh, it's entitled, What the Pandemic Reveals About the Male Ego. And so it was noted that if you look at countries led by women, the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 was dramatically lower overall than for countries led by men. And the comments really were that women are more likely to listen to the experts and maybe prioritize lives over, uh, over, kind of the, over the economy. Um, so I'm not sure. I think this is a very interesting observation. Um, I'm not sure if that's also true for individual facilities. I would just give a shout out though to our uh, leadership of the Cleveland VA. Beth Lumi has been leading the charge for, from the administration for SARS-CoV-2 uh, control and again, very evidence-based and following the, uh, the guidelines. So in summary, uh, prevention of COVID-19 is very challenging uh, in particular because shedding occurs if you have minimal symptoms or even no symptoms no symptoms, and before you become symptomatic. Uh, testing alone can be helpful, but is not sufficient. 
Uh, airborne transmission is a real concern in, set, in settings like restaurants and, and, and uh, public transportation. Uh, we as healthcare personnel are at risk, uh, but the evidence really suggests that if we're following appropriate uh, measures, including PPE, our risks uh, from patients are very low. You're more likely to be infected from one of your coworkers than you are from a patient at present. Uh, and there, there are really are a lot of new approaches that are worth studying, um, but I think including, you know, using povidone iodine, portable barriers, air disinfection, all of these require more evidence at this point. And so with that, I will close with just the final comment being that the, you know, the best prevention is going to be, is ultimately going to be vaccination. So all of you should be getting your vaccine. Thank you. Curtis, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, there are some questions in the chat. I, I was I wanted to ask a question about, and maybe this is an impossible question to answer. Is um, what do you think the relative contribution of fomites is? I know back in um, you know, February, March, and April, all, all the way until I was fully vaccinated, you know, I was extremely careful with my hands. Like every doorknob seemed like you know a death sentence, and. Uh, um, uh, so what's your take? I know maybe it's an impossible question to answer. What's your take on how many of, of the of the cases are are from, um, from people touching high touch objects, like you know door handles, elevator buttons? And, I, and maybe there's no data on that. Yeah, I, it would be impossible to give an exact estimate. I think most experts believe that fomite mediated uh, fomites are responsible for a minority of transmission, maybe five percent. Um, and that, in part, is because of the characteristics of the virus. So SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus, which is, you know, much, even though it, you can demonstrate in a lab setting that it survives for hours on today's on surfaces, it's really much less stable on a surface than MRSA or C. diff or other organ, or rhinovirus for that matter. So I think um, the amount of virus and the r relatively rapid uh, loss of uh, virus makes it relatively unlikely. I do think that, so you're probably, probably a doorknob is not likely to be a high risk uh, object, but, it, but on the other hand, if I hand you my television remote um, and, I'm, and I'm coughing and sick, and someone who touches something immediately after, if you touch something immediately after I've touched it, there may still be some live virus on there. So it's really more, uh, I worry about surfaces that someone else touches and then I touch it shortly after. A surface that hasn't been touched for, for 12 hours, the virus is probably dead by that point. Yeah. I'll ask Dr. Hecker about who, who has the remote most often in, in your household. <laughs> <laughs> hey, D Dr. Chandra asked an interesting question. I don't know, Raj, I can, it was in the chat. Raj attends yeah. an acute care setting with COVID patients as much as anybody. And he just reflected that we've seen a lot of patients here who were in the hospital for a long time negative, 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 and then, and then acquired COVID. So the question is, um, uh, nosocomial transmission, two patients you know, in the hospital, uh, the question, in these cases are providers, presumably the vectors of transmission, maybe you know, pre-symptomatic, um, is hospital acquired COVID a major issue? It's kind of in the, in the middle of the chat. Um, so just about nosocomial transmission, two That's patients. Enormous. So there isn't a lot of evidence here. There was one publication from uh, from a group from Harvard where they suggested that nosocomial transmission was very uh, was very uncommon. Um, I think the one scenario where we clearly see nosocomial transmission, where there's no question, again, our patients were in the hospital for a long period of time, and in particular nursing homes. If a nursing home resident has been in their facility for more than 14 days, which which is which is very common and they acquire COVID, it's very likely that they acquired it from uh, one of the healthcare personnel and let, because we're now restricting, you know, social activities among residents. So importation of uh, SARS-CoV-2 into nursing home populations is clearly a problem by personnel who are pre-symptomatic or, or um, um, you have mild symptoms. And we've seen people coming to work who, ha despite having mild symptoms at the VA, um, so this is, you know, the current recommendation is to screen both the uh, patients and the, the residents, I should say, and the personnel of nursing homes 
in order to try to reduce the risk for transmission. We do see occasional patients in the hospital um, who test negative and then test positive. So we clearly are seeing some nosocomial transmission in hospitalized patients, but it's been re relatively uncommon in comparison to nursing homes. Awesome. And th there was a question from Ellie about um, op op operating room air management, you know, negative pressure, positive pressure, operating room, ante rooms. What's your take on kind of optimal management of patients going for surgery? Yeah, so we, you know, we pre-screen everyone coming, going for surgery, as I'm sure you do at UH um, as well. Um, we would not require negative pressure unless we have a known COVID case uh, in, the, in the OR, so we don't, you know, make our entire OR a negative pressure uh, setting. Um, and, you know, we had been intubating, we do intubate in, uh, we had been intubating in a negative pressure room. That's not an absolute requirement now at the VA that you have to intubate negative pressure, but that's, we prim that is our primary site for, for intubation. We intubate in negative pressure and then move to a positive pressure room. Awesome. Um, I think there's a question from Rana about um, uh, steam inhalation um, being promoted. Steam inhalation. Yeah, I'm not, and if Rana, you're on. Um, there, there's a question for, uh, that is on everyone's mind about, um, and I, I think those of us who follow this part know the answer about transmission post vaccine. Um, I'll go back to steam for one second. So <laughs> just to mention, so steam is highly effective at killing SARS CoV 2 within you know, a five second steam exposure. Um, is very effective at uh, at killing SARS-CoV-2, and it's one thing you could potentially use for decontamination of, you know, face masks and respirators potentially. Um, the transmission after vaccination. So the data that we have, we don't have uh, significant data from the Pfizer trial. Uh, there is data from the Moderna vaccine suggesting that asymptomatic uh, carriage of SARS-CoV-2 is relatively uncommon, or quite uncommon after uh, vaccination. So the hope is that the vaccine is not only going to protect you from getting symptomatic infection, but also reduce transmission by preventing uh, asymptomatic uh, shedding as well. Yeah. I think the corollary to the steam is maybe we could like inject bleach or steam into people. Um, yes, uh, that would not be recommended. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a provocative question that USA is 4% of the global population, but 20% uh, COVID positive. So yeah, I guess it's a reflection on our, our overall, uh, overall healthcare approach to, uh, um, and then probably, uh, you know, for Dr. Jacona has a question that's on all of our mind. Um, what criteria must be met for a group of 100% vaccinated individuals might return to in-person activities? In other words, um, you know, in the residency, we're, once we're, we're considering having all if vaccinated residents being able to gather in person, um, I don't know if you have any comment on that. Are you on Frank's question toward the bottom of the chat? Um, oh, yeah. What criteria must be met before a group of 100% vaccinated individuals might return to in-person activities, um, like vaccinated physicians attending in-person grand rounds? Um, you know, I think we're waiting for a bit more evidence um, from the Pfizer trial and from um, Moderna as well, just more definitive evidence that, that asymptomatic shedding is uncommon in that setting. But if everyone is vaccinated, um, as you're suggesting, we think the, I, I think we will, by spring, hopefully begin to start seeing some opportunities to uh, return to those types of activities. Yeah, I mean, we'd like to have a spring dinner, a graduation dinner, and then have, you know, if people have to be vaccinated. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Ron asked a question, um, for people on mechanical ventilation, do you really believe 10 days is adequate to recover? So people that with severe enough cars causing uh, COVID causing respiratory failure. So the question is for non-immunocompromised pa uh, patients is 10 days sufficient for isolation? Yeah, for, for yeah, immunocompetent patients that are, are developed severe uh, SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia. 
there's 10 days. Yeah, so the, you know, the, the, the CDC guidance um, suggests that both, that for, for non-immunocompromised individuals, 10 days is sufficient. The qualifier of that is immunocompromised or patients with severe disease. So they actually they cite specific uh, evidence that individuals with severe uh, COVID-19 pneumonia uh, may continue shedding beyond 10 days and with some recovery of a viable virus at day 15. Uh, so I think patients who have, very, who have severe infections can also stay in isolation for a longer period than 10 days, 20 days being more reasonable. Yeah, and I think your, your slide kind of talks this, but, but just in general, influenza this year, there's a couple of silver linings of the pandemic. One is I think we'll keep doing grand rounds by Zoom, even when we have the in-person option. Another silver lining is we're not seeing any, any influenza this year. Um, any comment on that, Curtis? Yeah, that, and you know the slide that's up right now really it, it was one comment that I left out on that. That in the southern hemisphere, rates of influenza and other uh, respiratory viruses were dramatically lower during the uh, during the flu season. And the data we have so far here um, suggests that as well. Um, so, you know, the evidence really suggests that, you know, universal masking and wearing eye protection, all these things we're doing, uh, social distancing, will help prevent spread of other viruses, you know, suggesting that maybe some more of these types of practices should be considered even at, we should consider doing more of this even after um, the pandemic is over uh, to try to prevent uh, transmission during the flu season, for example. Yeah. Um, it's one o'clock. There's a, there's a, well, I don't know if there's any questions in chat you want to jump on. I think people are starting to, to hop off the chat because it is one o'clock. Again, I w just want to thank you again for uh, offering to do grand rounds. As always, it's awesome. And uh, you'll be back next week for C. diff. Oh, next year for C. diff. Just kidding. But, uh, if you don't mind, feel free to answer. I'll answer. So, uh, you know, Usha, Usha Stiebel uh, comments that the CDC defines anyone on oxygen as severe. Um, that is true. I think that um, the question is, do we keep people who are, who are on oxygen uh, in isolation for 20 days as opposed to 10 days? And, you know, my practice has been to, you know, consider someone who has very severe disease, who is in the ICU, um, as severe disease requiring 20 days of isolation, but not necessarily someone who just requires um, a brief period of oxygen. And there's a question about school-age kids and a cutoff. I think we've learned recently that Maybe grade school age kids seem to be low risk of transmission, and you know high school age kids seem to be higher risk of transmission. But I don't know what the cutoff is. Do you have any comment, Curtis? And then after that, I think we probably should cut it off. Um, there was there has been some discrepancies in the literature on that. There was one suggestion that uh, younger children were at lower risk for transmission, but then subsequent studies have, have raised questions about whether that's really true or not. There was a recent meta-analysis on transmission among uh, school children. So I'm not, uh, there, you know, there is a, a comprehensive kind of look at that in the literature that, again, suggested that that, that cutoff may be a little bit uh, uh, not not as valid as initially thought. Yeah. Awesome. I, th I think I know um, a lot of people have one o'clock activities. Uh, so grateful for a fantastic talk and, uh, you know, vir virtual and real applause. <laughs> Thanks, Curtis. That was really awesome. All right. Thank you very much.